Good day. I say hello from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where it's evening and very cold. I'm a bit envious because uh, it should be quite warm in Australia at this hour. And I look forward to spending the next hour and a half with you. I'll talk for something less than an hour, um, then welcome questions and comments from the floor. And then my wife, who is at a faculty meeting where she teaches at Boston College, will come here and she will speak uh, um, probably uh, about an hour and a half from now. I need to check that um, you can hear me and that you can see the slides. Um, so maybe you should wave your hands if you can hear me and see, and see me. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Um, it's true that I'm going to talk some about truth, theory, and goodness today, but I'm really going to focus on beauty since this is a conference of people involved in the arts, and uh, truth and goodness will be as uh, bookends to a discussion of beauty. And the discussion grows out of a book that I published a few years ago, Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Reframed, where I try to think about these long-standing, if not eternal, virtues and how they had need to be rethought in the era of Twitter, of social media, and also truthiness, uh, a word that was coined some years ago by a, a comic television personality, Stephen Colbert, um, which refers to something we're getting a great deal of exposure to in the United States these days, people saying things which have no truth value, but repeating them over and over again until people think they're true. So for those of us who are interested in the traditional virtues, um, both the social media and um, we might say a postmodern perspective on life make the the presentation of truth, beauty, and goodness more challenging, but also, I guess I would say, more interesting. So I begin with questions which are very big, and any of you who are involved in education will be thinking about these questions, uh, probably both unconsciously and consciously, what we should teach, what students should learn, and uh, should this be different in the 21st century, and if so, how? Very fundamental questions. And I begin by um, talking about three sets of three. First, we have the three virtues of the title, truth. And you might be thinking about what does truth mean to you? Beauty. Again, what, is, what does beauty mean to you? And goodness, which might translate as justice or fairness, um, but uh, a state that we all would prefer to be in rather than badness or whatever the opposite evilness uh, of good is. Um, as sort of a side comment, um, as an educator, I've come to think about what I'm doing as being in between the literacies and the job listings. Literacies is, of course, the reason we initially began schools, so that young people everywhere could learn to read and write and calculate. And I've never met anybody who's opposed to young children learning those literacies. And of course, at the end of the day, we do want young people to get a job, and that's what job listings are about. But I would say there's at least 10 years between literacies and the job listings. And truth, beauty, and goodness, I'm going to argue, are what we should be working with and working about and, and inculcating a sense of in children, say, from once they become literate to the time that they're on the, the job market. And as an aside, I'll say that you could read an awful lot of speeches by politicians, certainly in my country, but I suspect in other countries as well, where the only things they talk about are literacies and job listings, and uh, everything else gets short shrift. So. Here is the conclusion that I came to when I wrote about truth, beauty, and goodness a few years ago. Um, truth is about the accuracy of statements. Basically, when somebody says something in words or perhaps in logical symbols, um, we want to know whether what they say is accurate or not. 
Um, there are lots of things which we don't say in words, but which we could. For example, many artists work in silence, but if you ask them what they're doing, they could put it in words, and then we could assess whether their words are accurate or not. So truth is about statements. Beauty, I'm going to argue, is about experiences. Now notice the move here. Most people would say beauty is about objects. You know, this painting, this building, um, this poem, this story, um, maybe you know, this flower. But I'm going to argue it's not really about objects. It's about experiences. And because it's easier to talk about the visual arts, and I imagine many of you are involved with the visual arts, I'm going to use visual arts primarily as an example, but I'm going to argue that beauty is not about the objects, it's about experiences. So that, I think, will be a stretch, I hope an interesting stretch. And then the good, which, like the truth, is not going to be my subject tonight, good is about the way we relate to other people, both people who are close to us, relatives, neighbors, friends, and people who are more remote from us, people who might be halfway around the world, we only commute with, communicate with them online, or people whom we encounter as professionals, as teachers or as um, med doctors or nurses. And uh, those aren't people who we necessarily know personally, but we have a certain way of relating to them. So if you were to go to the book that I flashed, Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Reframed, you would read what I have to say about truth and goodness, but today we're really going to focus on beauty. When we look at any of these virtues, um, I begin analytically with what's the standard view of what truth is? What's the standard view of beauty? What's the standard view of goodness? And then, as the truthiness Twitter subtitle suggests, um, how do we think about these virtues in view of the postmodern critique, which I'll touch on, or also in view of many different cultures which might not have the same view that the, the Western culture, which would include Australia, though not the natives, the aboriginals who Katie referred to, what are their views of, or some of you may be members of those groups, what are your views of truth, beauty, and goodness? And then, um, even if we get some agreement within uh, traditional centers, what happens when we live in a digital world where everything can be connected, change, um, preserved, um, fragmented, and so on. So even if you think that you know all about truth, beauty, and goodness, you need to confront the challenges which both a postmodern critique and the technological advances pose to those traditional virtues. And finally, remember we had three trios. <laughs> the last one is what, how does the unschooled mind think about this? And the unschooled mind is neither good nor bad. It's the way that uh, people who haven't gone to school, typically young people, think about things. Then what do we try to achieve in traditional formal schooling, which everybody in the audience, I'm sure, had? And then something which is more important nowadays than ever before, how do we continue learning through life? Um, in my grandparents' generation and in my parents as well, you know, you would have whatever education you had. Grandparents probably elementary school, parents, high school, um, maybe college, and then you would be sort of prepared for life. But now, of course, if you want to continue working, and um, Katie has already revealed how old I am, uh, you have to keep learning. You can't just uh, rest on those, uh, let's say, five to 20-year-old uh, lessons. All right, so, so much for background. Let's begin to think about the issue of beauty at least in the West, and again, for my purposes, Australia is part of the West because it was settled uh, by people primarily from um, Europe. Um, there, if you say the word beauty, people will think right away of a, of a Greek um, urn, vase, amphora, or a painting of a cattle or person in some kind of a sylvan setting. Um, or a uh, portrait of a, of a, of a young, young child. These would be kind of traditional views of beauty, and if we just sort of asked the person on the street, uh, 
for examples in the visual arts, these are the kind of examples that they, they would give. Or they might pick a, an example from nature, uh, a, uh, an imposing mountain, um, a rainforest, a, a field, um, a set, set of flowers, and so on. So when I talk about traditional views, nobody would, would object too much if I used the word beauty with, re, with reference to these three or four examples. Um, there's also um, empirical research, uh, which was done by two artists with a psychological bent, uh, Komar and Malamid. And what they did is all over the world, not just in the West, um, they gave people paired um, visual presentations and they said to them, which do you like better? So this was one pair, I'll give it to you again, this one or this one, and I think I might have one more this one or this one. And uh, I bet you if I ask you to predict what people would select, you would, you'd all get it right. People prefer to have this uh, bucolic natural scene with some kind of an animal or and water and uh, mountains or some kind of green life um, than this uh, set, of, a set of rectangles. Um, and we might say that's kind of the traditional or unschooled view of beauty. Um, however, uh, and this is more for the question session later, I think the notion that we're wired to admire something, some things and not others as beautiful is, is not viable. Um, you have to come up with very extreme examples like this and choose your subjects carefully in order to get unanimity that this is more beautiful than this. Nonetheless, we have to start somewhere, and this is kind of the unschooled view. Um, but, as I said, uh, living in the 21st century, there are two very powerful threats to any traditional or unschooled account of beauty, or for that matter, truth or goodness. Um, one of them is postmodernism, which is both a philosophical approach um, coming out of the uh, Western Europe, mostly in the latter part of the 20th century, um, but also out of anthropology, cultural studies, where there's a critique of the notion that any society should be able to declare what's true, beautiful, or good, because other societies might have a different perspective. And there's certainly a lot to this, but postmodernism makes it much harder for those of us who are educated to say, well, this is true and this is not, this is beautiful, this is not, this is good, as this is not. Um, so. If you were to read the philosophical or aesthetic literature um, and you saw the word beauty, you would find people say, that's a thing of the past. People used to talk about beauty, but it's off the table now. Or um, if they're more politically uh, inclined, beauty is decided by the people who have power and the people who wield the scorecard. Maybe it's the curators in the museum who decide what's beautiful or the people who decide which books to publish and the rest of us just have to go along. Um, we have no real say. Yeah, these are quite anarchistic views, but they're not easy to, um, to refute through any kind of, a, of, a, of, a, of an argument. So that's the postmodern or relativistic position. And I think most of you have run into this, whether or not you happen to be sympathetic to it. Um, and probably the more you hang around galleries, uh, the more you'd, be, you'd at least be familiar with this line, line of argument. For about a half a century, philosophers were discouraged from even using the word beauty because it was seen as being so loaded and so uh, anti-postmodern, if you will. Um, whether or not you read philosophy and postmodernism, we all are aware of the transformed effects of all kinds of technology. And the very fact that I can be talking to you from Cambridge, and presumably you're seeing and hearing me, and I'm showing you slides, it would have been unthinkable even 15 years ago. Uh, and it gets better and better. So there, we are beneficiaries of, of technology, um, but it's also very disruptive. That's the right, right word. This is virtual reality, second life, where you can make things which look awfully real um, if you have the right equipment. Um, there are multi-user games involving thousands or even millions of people, which have probably as much influence on young people, particularly boys, as whatever we do in school. Um, I always say there are two kinds of people, people who belong to Facebook and liars, um, 
but certainly social media has incredible power. And uh, I would guess that uh, most young people, boys and girls, spend at least as much time on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, et cetera, as they do hitting their books or doing their, their sums. Twitter, of course, um, hundreds of millions of people uh, communicate using uh, 140 characters or less. And those of us who insist on using more than 140 characters often feel quite anachronistic. And uh, uh, nowadays, more people learn about things from social media than from newspapers or broadcast. Um, so just as the postmodern view is a real challenge to any traditional view of beauty or truth or goodness, so too the digital world is just incredibly disruptive. Anybody can create or circulate anything. The notion that we have canonical forms that we should all um, bow to or consider to be hegemonic is not sustainable anymore. Um, I came up with some M's here. Anything can be mashed, merged, meshed, massacred with anything else. Um, so we might say, well, you know, what's beautiful is that what's liked the most, because on many social media, you can say whether you like or don't like something, but crowds aren't always wise. Sometimes they're quite stupid. And also people with power can manipulate the likes. Um, I know for a fact how many people who publish books will get all their friends to write positive things on Amazon. And same thing with restaurants, the same things with artists, and so on. Um, so you can see how the digital world, which is, again, has many wonderful things, shakes up lots of assumptions that certainly uh, people who, were, uh, who grew up in the 20th century would find uh, quite uh, unnerving. And um, uh, my wife, Ellen, who actually just came into to the, the room, so she's here early, and I were in Hong Kong. Um, in uh, November of 2014, and we were talking about the app generation, young people who are involved with apps, and somebody said, what about Alex from Target? And I kind of wrinkled my brow. I had no idea what they were talking about, but this was a bunch of people in Hong Kong who didn't know about Alex from Target. And so I dredged up a photograph, and this is Alex from Target, actually, at Starbucks. Um, what happened in the summer of 2014 is somebody took a snapshot of a kid sitting um, at Target. Um, I think he was packing a bag or packing a box or something. And uh, this person circulated to friends. They thought Alex was cute. And within days, uh, Alex at Target was sent to millions of people. So if there was any popularity contest, say, between the Venus de Milo and Alex at Target, he would have, he would have won the day. <laughs> by now, probably, he's been forgotten. One cost of being viral is you can soon be replaced by something else that's viral. But again, um, this notion of what we should pay attention to and what we should, should um, value is, is by no means sturdy. In December, I, was, I attended a meeting with a bunch of uh, people who were about 20 years old because they were talking about what it meant to be iconic. And I thought they might talk about political leaders, let's say Martin Luther King Jr., or Ronald Reagan, or, or John Kennedy, or that maybe they would talk about business leaders um, like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, but they didn't. They actually talked about people who are featured in fashion ads and who dress in a certain way or have their hair in a certain way or are made up in a certain way. And that's the iconicity of today. And whether or not one likes it, this is where our young people are. And if we want to talk about beauty, we can't ignore the realms in which they're finding iconic signs. And if Alex of Target is one of them, uh, that's, you know, that, that's not something we can, we can ignore in favor of the traditional forms of beauty. So how do I try to make sense of all this? This is my first attempt in a book where I talked about truth, beauty, and goodness without at all a critical spirit. And some people read and liked that book, but I wouldn't have written Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Reframed if I hadn't been persuaded between the late 20th century when this book was published and the early 21st century when Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Reframed was published, if I hadn't been convinced 
that you can't just accept truth, beauty, and goodness with that traditional view that I talked about, but you have to take into account the postmodern critique and the technological challenges. So the disciplined mind is where I started 15 years ago. And at that time, I kind of accepted what a, what a history of art book would talk about. This is Jansen's famous uh, book, which many of you will have used if you took a, a course in art history. And again, the, the classic views of a, a Greek urn or a Sylvan theme or a young portrait. So that, that's where I was um, 15 years ago. I think a but is coming. Let's see. Yes. <laughs> but how preference change? Because I want you now to fasten your seatbelt and take a look at what's happened in the history of the visual arts, basically in painting, but in, to some extent in three-dimensional works, over the last 150 years or so. It's breathtaking. So 200 years ago, Manet, um, 150 years ago, Manet was already considered to be quite controversial. Uh, people were not sure that what he was doing was beautiful, though I think most people now would feel that he was. Cezanne, very disruptive when he was painting. Too future-oriented. <clears throat> Painters like Manet and Monet, yes, they were not even allowed to um, exhibit their works in the academies. They had to be in the Salon des Refusés for people whose artwork was not accepted by the establishment. Now, of course, uh, Manet and Cezanne and Monet are considered to be old hat. But keep your seatbelt on. There's Picasso. Early Picasso, again, seemed to be within the main tradition. But all of a sudden, 100 years ago, a little bit longer, he paints Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, arguably the most valuable painting after the Mona Lisa, and suddenly doing things which looked like other painters and looked like representation of the world was out. And this is, of course, a pivot point to cubistic art. And decades later, again, disrupting in another way with his political work, Guernica. So Picasso, that's still probably, you know, most people would, would uh, say, yeah, yeah, he's a great artist. Uh, uh, people have a funny, weird way of thinking about it as being beautiful, but I guess so. But then, this I, an article I read in the New York Times um, just last week said Jackson Pollock was the most important artist of the second half of the 20th century. What do you make of this? What do you make of splattering paint on a canvas? Um, when um, when um, Jackson Pollock made this work, many people said, my kids can do that. But Ellen, are you going to tell them whether their kids can do that or not? I am. Ellen is Ellen Winner just walked in, is going to tell you that your kids couldn't do that. Um, but you'll have to wait an hour or so to hear her explanation. Um, but uh, what do we do with beauty when a solitary artist with a spray, can, spray paint can um, disrupts the whole way people think of the history of visual art? And I'm not going to comment on the next dozen or so paintings, but just to remind you how quickly our sense of art a valuable art, and I would suggest of beauty changes. My grandparents would certainly not have thought about this as being beautiful, but many, many contemporaries do. Willem de Kooning, just about the same time, his view of woman, very dark, very striking. Andy Warhol, Silk screens of disasters, crashes, deaths. Cindy Sherman, photographer, 
thousands of works. In, in, they're all self-portraits, except if you didn't know they were Cindy Sherman, you would think they were just pictures of different people. Like, this is Cindy Sherman again, but uh, in, totally enrolled in both photographs. Anselm Kiefer, one of the most valued painters of our time. I'll talk a bit now and later. This was paintings that at first I couldn't relate to at all, but now I do. And of course the paintings haven't changed. This is the key point. I've changed. And my exposure to art makes me very different than if I hadn't visited many Kiefer exhibits, including one in Sydney, I believe, 10 or 15 years ago, major exhibit there. This is a work that was on display uh, several years ago at New York's Museum of Modern Art. It's by Matthew Barney, very valued contemporary artist, called The Deportment of the Host. The Deportment of the Host. I could make no sense of this work at all. If I walked by it, I might have thought it was just a, something that was being set up for something else. But when both the curator and my wife spoke about the work as being beautiful, that got my attention. And that's very important. Because if somebody whom you respect says something is beautiful, even if you don't see it, it makes you wonder, what are they seeing? What are they hearing? What are they getting from that work? What are they getting from that experience? What are they getting from that food? What are they getting from that conversation? And now we're beginning to move into how I think about beauty and experiences. And sometimes these are judgments that you make solo, but very, very often, as in the last 150 years of art that I've just showed you, and there's more to come, you change because you talk to other people, or you read other people, or you see juxtaposed things. You say, my goodness, there's more there than I thought. There's more there than I understood. There's more there than I perceived. It gets even wilder, that's what the slide says. Because everything I've shown you so far is made by human beings. But here's artwork that's done strictly by computers. And they often get our attention, and we put them on walls, and we put them on museums. Um, and suddenly, beauty is no longer a property of human-made objects, but a property of things done by rules, by a computational algorithm. This, for example, um, is simply a, uh, a record of um, the use of the internet in different locations within a geographic polity with the dense light areas where there's more internet use. No human hand there. This is a fun thing where you have a wand and you make a certain shape with the wand and then lo and behold, you get furniture which uh, captures the movements that you made. 3D maker enterprises. How do we think about that? So everything I've shown you now is visual arts. And if you are a frequent gallery goer, they won't be a surprise to you. But if you're not, I hope you'll stru be struck by these works, all of which are very esteemed by people who are very knowledgeable, unless they're all fooling themselves. Um, they stretch the notion of what it means to be beautiful. And in my case, often stretch my own views. But it isn't just the visual arts. Um, there's architecture, and you have traditional views of what's beautiful. But uh, this is what Frank Lloyd Wright wrought um, in the late 50s. I should have included the Sydney uh, Opera House but it's known to all of you, another landmark architecture work. Um, the Whitney Museum, which has now been supplanted by a new Whitney, 
in New York. This is the old Whitney. Frank Gehry, work that could not have been done in a pre-computational age, um, but you know, cities now will do anything to get the Gary landmark the way Bilbao did in Spain, um, because it can be transformative for an economy. This is a monument that would have been unthinkable in the 19th century. It's the Vietnam War Memorial. Simply 57,000 names in a very stark black background. And we need only to think about literature. This is Samuel Beckett and what his plays and poems and stories have done to our literary sensibility. Or Igor Stravinsky, Picasso's equal in the area of classical music and uh, how his works, beginning with the Rite of Spring, came out just 100 years ago, um, have changed what people value in the area of music. So um, what I've been trying to do is to say that if you haven't been asleep, I don't mean you, <laughs> the audience, but I mean if a human being hasn't been asleep but has been paying attention to what's happening in all the traditional areas of art, whether it's music, literature, poetry, um, architecture, painting, sculpture, um, our sense of what's possible and what's admired has changed so much that any notion of a canon um, is just hopelessly anachronistically, it's hopelessly out of date. Um, this has two personal examples. This is a work that was done by a um, contemporary artist named Rodney Graham, and it's a fascinating story. He went, he, went, he went to Germany maybe 10, 15 years ago, and he found an old typewriter, which had actually been made early in the 20th century, but had never been um, used. And he bought the old typewriter, and then he put it outside, and he let it be covered by snow. We have snow in Boston today, but it's pretty far away from where you are. And he put on a camera to um, let people see how the typewriter began looking like a typewriter 80 years old um, and then was slowly covered by snow. Don't ask me why, but I went and watched this several times. Obviously, it had deep impact on me, and I still don't know why. If you'd simply said to me, Howard, you know, you're going to look, see if I had an old typewriter covered in the snow, I would say, how preposterous. Um, but there was something about it which I found absolutely riveting, and I would go back and see it again. It's just 10 minute uh, um, with an old, um, I think it's 16 millimeter uh, projector showing you the, uh, um, the typewriter as it's slowly covered by snow. And then I still wouldn't say that I consider the deportment of the host my favorite work. And maybe you'll ask Ellen when she speaks why she liked it. But the fact that somebody I respect found it beautiful, I think particularly the, the color and the uh, material, uh, made me think that there was something that I needed to stretch, but I wasn't able to stretch sufficiently, though in the case of Anselm Kiefer, uh, I think I turned the corner. So, um, what have we done until this point? Um, I've argued that in each, with reference to each of the virtues, this kind of traditional view, which uh, uh, people grew up with, um, and probably there's still the view of the unreflective person on the street, and I don't mean that to be pejorative, I mean it to be descriptive, um, but since I think we want to be more reflective than the average person on the street, and we'd like our students to be more reflective, we need to think about what happens to these virtues when on the one hand, you have very profound thinkers challenging any kind of a simplistic definition of truth, beauty, or goodness. On the other hand, taking a look at what technology makes possible, as well as just cultural change, um, any kind of recipe, like those two 
like those pairs of paintings where people like one better than the other is just woefully inadequate. And so um, what I've done, and I'm about to plunge you into it, is come up with the way that I think about beauty now, not in terms of objects, but rather in terms of experiences. And here's the, the headline. If we talk about beauty in our time, I argue that experiences are beautiful if they have three criteria. One, they're interesting. Two, their form is memorable, which means we can't just tell somebody about them. We have to essentially let them have that experience. And three, importantly, we want to have that experience again. We may not be able to have the exact experience again, but we'd like to revisit it. So there are things that are interesting, but we just, we just talk about them and tweet about them. The way the form in which we encountered them isn't matter. That's not beauty. Second of all, there are things that are memorable, but we might find them horrible. You see a dastardly act of violence. You may never forget it, but you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to have that experience again. So it's things which catch our attention, things which is something memorable, and things which you want to revisit again. Those are what I call beautiful experiences. And this is a, a bit of a wisecrack. As a reward for a beautiful experience, you get a pleasant tingle. It makes you feel good. So if you think about any of the paintings I showed you or architecture, uh, if, you had, if, if, you, if, if you kind of got a charge out of that, uh, perhaps you had some, some neurotransmitters, uh, you know, some uh, dopamine squirts or something, and that's a reward for a beautiful experience. And for extra credit, we could think about things that are spiritual or awful or awesome, A-W-E, but for me, um, I prefer not to use the word beauty for that, but rather things which uh, we can contemplate and want to be able to contemplate again. So let's talk about each of these three symptoms or criteria, pretty interesting. Um, psychologists have done a lot of work on what makes things interesting. Um, and what we find is if something, we've seen it over and over again or heard it over and over again, it loses interest. So it needs to be novel in some kind of a way. When things are varied, we want to pay more attention to them than when they're just same old, same old, same old. Also, we find that if things are too simple or too complicated, they're not as interesting to us as things which are intermediate, which have some complexity but not complexity that's overwhelming. So my field of psychology gives a little insight into what we find interesting. So here's a work of Donald Judd. If I said to you, you know, it's a, it's a you know, bunch of uh, metal rectangles piled up against the wall, uh, you know, you would probably not give that a second thought. But when you look at this, uh, especially if uh, you keep looking at it and it does different things to you, uh, you may say, yeah, this is worth seeing. I can't just tell people about it. I need to let them see it or let them see it in person. Of course, seeing them in the slide is much less impressive than seeing them in the flesh because these are big uh, rectangular features. So memorable form. I like this. This is a kind of, this is conceptual art. It's by Joseph Kasut and it's called Three Chairs. And of course it is three chairs. Um, on the left you have a photograph, on the right you have a regular 3D chair, and on the far right you have a definition from a dictionary. Now I could say to you, uh, you know, this guy produced three chairs and one was this and one was that, but what I find interesting is I, rem I find this worth looking at because it makes me think in a different way than if somebody just told me three chairs, but conceptual art is about thinking and it's not everybody's cup of tea. The next one is particularly suitable for a teaching audience. Uh, this is John Baldessari, a contemporary artist. Uh, and he has written two dozen times, I will not make any more boring art. Uh, again, a version of conceptual art. Um, but if you simply tell somebody, this guy wrote this, it's very different from my experience because it sort of looks like somebody had to repeat this, didn't do it exactly the same. And it reminds you of the, the tedium of life when, you're, uh, when you've been caught uh, doing something inappropriate, like making art that's boring, and you have to atone, atone for it. So, 
You have the first symptom. It's interesting. It gets your attention. It can be sound, sight, taste, whatever. Second, you want to, you find that it's worth trying to um, remember because there's something about the way it's presented, whether it's written or sung or recited or um, served, that, that isn't just exchangeable from other ways of doing it. And then this third feature, you haven't exhausted it. There are things which are interesting and you may remember, but you don't want to have it again, either because you've already gotten what you can out of it, or um, conversely, um, you find it rather awful and you don't want to have it again. So um, here are some things which have stood the, path, the, the, the test of time. And I bet some of you have been thinking, well, there are reasons why we valorize something, and that's because they stood the test of time. And I think that's true, but who would have predicted 40,000 years ago in a cave that we'd still be looking at this Paleolithic art? Maybe it's 30,000 years ago. Or this incredible uh, rock paintings from uh, caves in, in southern Europe. Or the pyramids worth seeing in person. Or Gothic church. Or the Easter Island, these huge statues whose meaning nobody quite knows, but they, they're haunting. Or Stonehenge even longer ago. Again, nobody knows quite what's going on here, but uh, most people who encounter them feel that they are interesting, a memorable form, and you'd like to see it again. I had probably seen a thousand photographs of the Taj Mahal, but when Ellen and I were lucky enough to be able to go to India three years ago, uh, we were not prepared for how incredible Taj Mahal is in person. I must say, certainly one of the most beautiful visual experiences I've ever had. Um, it doesn't need any beauty stars for me. But while I wouldn't say that Anselm Kiefer has all the same impact on me, I would go out of my way to see uh, his works. And that's a sign that for me, if not for you, they're interesting, form is memorable, and I'd like to see them again. Of course, they're huge. And I'm showing them in a slide doesn't begin to capture them. They're as big as you know, the wall of a room. And for me, the, the, uh, the jury is still out on Matthew Barney and the deportment of the host, but you can ask Ellen after her talk whether she uh, wants to tell you why she found it beautiful. So I actually taught this. In the last two weeks, I did a module on truth, beauty, and goodness, three hours a day. Um, and my students challenged my notions about um, interestingness and um, memorable form and desire to revisit by coming up with examples from realms which I hadn't thought about. One is pornography. I decided to use a safe picture. but. Uh, you know, porn pornography can be uh, interesting, memorable form, and you may not want to revisit the same pornography, but you may want to revisit one just like it. Is that, are those beautiful experiences? I don't want to easily say yes, but I'm not sure I have an argument against it. So pornography is one challenge. Sports, second challenge. Um, sports can be interesting, um, can have memorable form, you may not want to see the same game again, but you may want to come back to games. So maybe um, athletics is a source of beautiful experiences. And then what got me uh, most um, riled up was the notion of entertainment, you know, TV quiz shows. People watch these over and over again. Um, are, they, is, are they making a mistake or am I making a mistake in, in wondering whether these are beautiful experiences? And uh, the next slide, I don't know whether Ellen knows who this is. Ellen, do you know who this is? Uh, no. Brian, do you know who this is? 
Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian. Now, I didn't know what Kim Kardashian looked like, but I went online, and this is what she looks like. And um, nowadays, uh, she's not Alex at Target, but for many young people, celebrities like this are certainly interesting, memorable in form, and they want to be revisited. So as a person who formulates a certain definition of beauty, um, I can't really challenge other people's notions, but I can wonder whether there's something suboptimal of my own definition that it leaves things in which I think occupy a different status. And we can certainly, and could you talk about that when we move to Q&A soon? So um, while we've certainly been talking educationally, I haven't spoken directly about the implications of all this for educators. When I talk about an educator's solution, what I mean is um, how can we introduce our students, whether they're six years old or 16 or 60, and I mean those ages equally, to think about their beautiful experiences, whether they are art objects or come from another realm of life. And my notion is that from a young age, we should all be encouraged to keep portfolios of what we what experiences we cherish. I don't care whether you use Gardner's name or his definition of beauty, that's not relevant, but rather, what are those experiences which we think important enough that we'd like to be able to preserve them in some way, shape, or form? Portfolios used to be three-dimensional things, and I think that's still a value, but many people record their life online, and that can be a portfolio too. And, of course, you can also have a portfolio in your own mind. I'm much more oriented toward music than toward the visual arts, and there were a few performances which I can still hear in my ear, even though I never heard them recorded. Uh, they were that dramatic. So the portfolio can be in your mind, it can be online, or it can be physical. And a useful analogy, which I think almost everybody picks up, is food. When you're five or ten years old, what do you like? You like to go to... McDonald's and get hamburgers and french fries and malted. Maybe if you're like me, you still kind of like that every once in a while. But we're lucky to live in a world, uh, and Australia is filled with restaurants from all different ethnicities, um, whether it's Greek or um, Vietnamese or Italian. And our palates become much more differentiated, much more pluralistic. And it'd be very boring if we just liked the same things at, at 25 or 75 that we did when we were five years of age. And nobody finds this idea, I think, exotic. It seems to be quite commonsensical in any kind of a global society. But I'm saying that we should be thinking about not just what we eat, but the whole range of experiences. Again, objects, um, conversations, um, trips, anything which is interesting, memorable, and we want to have it again as part of our ongoing portfolio. So and what I'm going to do now is remind us that Probably, without any education, the unschooled mind still prefers certain things. Um, this is what the two um, experimental artists told us, that this is more preferable than a bunch of rectangles. Um, and this is what we learned from our books are things that we should consider beautiful, whether we did or not. Um, but I've been thinking with my class about young kids. and. Anybody who has young kids knows that one of the things that is irritating for many adults is to have to read or watch the same movie over and over again. So I don't know how many hundreds of times I read Goodnight Moon to my children and grandchildren. Uh, maybe Baby Beluga or Rafi, the singer. Um, or this is Frozen movie. Uh, I think so. Um, but when adults get bored repeating these things, it's because we've exhausted them. But for the child, they're not, they're not encountering the same thing over again because they're getting more each time. So when they heard Good Night Moon the 15th time, they're getting something out of it that they didn't get out of it the 14th time. And similarly, with listening to Rafi or going to a movie. So we have to understand that uh, young kids kind of give us, in, in fast motion, this experience of wanting to revisit things because it's interesting, but they haven't explored it entirely. But we as adults probably you know, don't get that much out of it, out of the thing anymore, so it gets to be boring for us. All right, so now um, 
fashion your seat belts for the second time tonight because um, I want to introduce you to an idea developed by Nelson Goodman, a great philosopher who was the founder of Project Zero 48 years ago. David Perkins and I were his first research assistants, and we remained with Project Zero till this day. And I met Ellen Winner in 1973 when she was one year old, uh, <laughs> when she was a student uh, at Project Zero. Um, so there's a long intellectual trajectory there. But what Goodman pointed out is when somebody tells you something is good or not, let's use the word beautiful, um, something is beautiful, it gets your attention, like that deportment of the host from Matthew Barney. And you may not understand why somebody thinks it's beautiful, but it's worth your trying to figure out why they think it's beautiful. And when Goodman talks about merit as means, the fact that somebody likes X more than Y or Y than more than X is immaterial. What's material is whether they see or hear the difference between X and Y and can in some way show you that difference. So if you're shown two portraits and somebody says, oh, this is beautiful, I don't like the other one, you could take their word for it. But what you really want to know is why is this one beautiful and that not? And that's what merit is means. It's if you see the difference, that's what's important. You can then decide what you like, what you want to pay for, what you'd like in your house, what you'd like to get rid of, and so on. Uh, and this came to me very dramatically when I went over 40 years ago. I went to see an exhibit in Minneapolis at the Institute of Arts on fakes and forgery. Now, if this was a class, I would say, class, who is this? And I can't hear you, but presumably some of you are seeing the Mona Lisa. And then I would say, well, who is this? And then some of you would say, the Mona Lisa. And then in that exhibit in Minneapolis 40-some years ago, there was in every bus a placard like this saying, well, the real Mona Lisa, please stand up. Now, um, you should look at these two, because they're obviously different from one another. And what's important is you see the difference. You see the difference in lighting. You see the difference in shading. You see the difference in facial expression. That's what's important. Now, you can decide you want to like the one on the left better or the one on the right better. One is worth billions. The other is worth nothing. Um, but the important thing is, do you see the difference? The merit is means for you to see the difference. And then you can decide what you like to, what you like or not. And this is a wonderful educational device because it makes people, whether it's two meals or two performances of a work of music or two buildings, if you don't see the difference, or you, don't, you think they're, in different, they're equally beautiful, or equally noticeable, and somebody says no, that makes you pay more attention. And Ellen is also going to talk later about what do people think about fakes and forgeries. Is that right, Ellen? Mm -hmm. And again, you'll see we have now interesting empirical work on that. So um, museums some years ago made an exhibit of Cezanne and Pissarro. And these were contemporaries. What's probably not known is they painted things very similar to one another. And the important thing is here, do you see the difference between the Cezanne and Pissarro? And then you can decide which one you like better. But the important thing, again, is do you see the difference? Do you hear the difference? Do you notice the difference? That becomes the basis for our aesthetic judgments that are worth paying attention to. Because if you like something better than something else, but you only like it better because somebody told you it was better or because it's worth more of money, that's not educationally helpful. But if somebody can point out to you the differences uh, and why they matter to that person, then it becomes an educational experience. So a game that I've been playing for many years with, and almost anybody who plays, which was by the child is which is worth millions. So one of these is by Helen Frankenthaler, very famous 20th century artist. Uh, it's the one on the right. Um, but you might like the one on the left. The important thing is, do you see the difference? Uh, one of these is by Jackson Pollock. The other is by a young child. One of these is by Hans Hoffmann. The other by a young child. And one of these is by famous Chinese artist, and the other is by a child, an uh, adolescent. And do you see the difference? Merit is means. Once you notice the difference, then we can talk about um, why, what it is that you value and why. But if you don't see the difference, then we can't have a conversation. So we didn't talk about truth in any detail tonight, but sorry this morning, it's night here, morning there. Um, there's an interesting distinction between truth, as I study it, and beauty. Truth, we want to have convergence. We want to bring more and more evidence to bear using better and better methods 
to decide which statements are worth taking seriously as being true and which are not. And so even though we never can discover the ultimate truth, we have a chance over time to figure out more and more what was it that really happened at a certain time, or what, how the nature of the physical world or natural world is really like. The wonderful thing about beautiful experiences is that I divergent. Every person in the world can have a different roster of what they consider beautiful than everybody else, and it doesn't matter a bit. In fact, it's probably good. It also doesn't cost anything. We've got 7 billion people in the world that can have 7 billion aesthetics. They can each keep a portfolio of what they value, whether it's in the mark, music, nature, conversation, food, life. And again, uh, the more the merrier. And in a world where almost everything else is scarce, it's wonderful that we can let the 7 million um, portfolios bloom. There's no limitation. We may begin with traditional history, as I did, and as many of you did. But if you want to understand 20th century abstract art, we're not going to get that from a traditional history <clears throat> book. The book I found most valuable was Kirk Barnardo's book, Pictures of Nothing, a wonderful title. You see the subtitle is Abstract Art Since Pollock. And if you want to have a sure guide to why it is that um, Jackson Pollock and his colleagues changed everything, uh, the Barnardo book is an excellent introduction to that. And it really does make you see things differently because you notice all sorts of things. And you understand the way in which artists, mostly in New York, mostly in the 50s, were talking to each other every day, both in language, but more importantly by what they were doing. People I showed you, whether it was Pollock or um, de Kooning or Frankenthaler, they were all showing their works to each other every day, just as Picasso and Brock were doing 50 years earlier. And that's an important part of understanding what's going on in any realm, is that what, what's being shown and discussed and listened to um, at the particular historical moment. So my educational goal in the area of beauty is that we should each put together a portfolio of what it is that we value and why. We like this, or like this, or like this, and I should have a melange of Facebook um, home pages because that's another place where you can keep your portfolio. And um, I've already showed you one entry, but I want to show you a kind of a funny one. When I was in high school, I became very fond of classical music, and I liked Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto. I still like it. But what I liked the best was to listen to different, different performances of the piano concerto and who did it the most quickly. And um, Vladimir Horowitz actually did it the most quickly. So he became, he did the fastest. He became my favorite <coughs> pianist. Now that's a very primitive notion of aesthetics. Who does it fastest? I'm sort of embarrassed if anybody, including me, says that now. But the important part is at that point, that's what I valued, and that's fine. That would have been in my portfolio, and that's the reason why. But that changes. And as I say, I still love uh, the music of Tchaikovsky and other composers, not all the same ones, but I'm no longer listening to see who does it the most quickly. Um, and again, I can't explain very well why this is in my portfolio, but uh, I'm going to keep it there for a long time. So, um, I've been with you about an hour. Um, we've gone on a roller coaster. We've covered a lot of things, um, probably not familiar to most of you. Um, I hope your appetite is whetted enough that uh, you might take a look at the, my book, Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Refrain. So, I'm certainly not here to promote the book, but if you find the ideas interesting, they are dealt with in some detail there. Uh, but I also will mention that I haven't figured it out yet. And that's why I taught this module for two weeks, three hours a day, and why I'm going to teach a um, whole course on it this coming fall. And to get sort of the moral of the story, um, maybe I'll give you the summary and conclusions, and I'll give you the moral of the story. So we started uh, an hour ago by talking about um, 
tooth, beauty, and goodness, which have been valued for thousands of years. But uh, here we are, and we need to try to figure out um, how do we think about these things today when, on the one hand, um, both philosophers and anthropologists challenge any hegemonic, any top-down view of what's beautiful, and when the, the digital media, which are so fantastic and so versatile, make everything flux and everything change. Remember Alex of Target, or though probably nobody remembers him anymore. Um, then why I decided tonight, for obvious reasons, since this is a conference of people involved with the arts, to focus on beauty rather than truth or goodness, I reminded you both of what people choose as beautiful when they're just given choice of two, and it's pretty obvious what the unschooled mind will prefer, um, and then reminded you what's been canonical, the, uh, the Greek vases and the uh, paintings from the Renaissance and the uh, Romantic era. Um, but then when I ask you to fasten your seatbelt to see how over five or 10 year periods we go from Pollock to Warhol to de Kooning to Matthew Barney to Roger Graham, and it's quite amazing. We don't know which of these will be looked at or listened to 100 years from now, but we know some of them will. Having produced, I su suspect, a certain disequilibrium in you all, I then laid out what I thought are the three criteria for an experience of beauty, that the experience, whether it's looking at an object or going on a ride or dreaming, is interesting, the form is memorable, and you'd like to um, have that experience again, either in your own mind or preferably in the flesh. Um, but uh, as my students reminded me, uh, Howard, are you happy if pornography, if athletics, if game shows, and if Kim Kardashian are all examples of beauty? And I guess the answer is, um, I hope those aren't the only ones, and I hope that they change over time. But we all have to start somewhere, and if I started with how fast the, uh, the Harwoods played the Tchaikovsky, so much the better. Um, what's important is that we be able to make distinctions, and be able to point them out and explain them to some way, and particularly to our students who don't see any difference or who wonder why should anybody pay any attention to this at all. And I guess the answer is that all of us cherish certain things, and it's free doesn't impose on anybody else. We should cherish them, collect them, share them with others. Are we willing to change and grow and to have more diverse, more differentiated experiences as we get older? And I said that beauty is wonderfully divergent. Everybody can have their own aesthetics. It makes no difference. Um, in that sense, it's a, it's, a, it's a gift from the gods. But when I said I wanted to close with Moral. I want to go back to what I said at the very beginning of the talk, and that is we don't need me or the work of Project Hero to justify the illiteracies. Obviously, they're very important. And maybe today coding is more important than Greek, but the basic literacies are very important. Second of all, we want people to be employed. We want them to like what they're doing. And at a certain point, the job, the vocational um, panorama is important. But Human beings have accomplished incredible things in the arts, sciences, humanities, architecture, music, poetry. And I think it's criminal if we don't share those human accomplishments with our young people. And there are many ways to do that. But the way that I've arrived at, because I think it, it unites the classical era with today is to help people think better about statements that individuals make and whether they have truth value, to think more deeply and to collect more broadly about the experiences which are worth valorizing. And then what's probably more important than either, but a subject for another day, what does it mean to have good relations with others, people near us, people far away, and what does it mean to be a good worker, a good person, a good citizen, which is what I talk about in my most recent work. So with that, and with a thank you slide, 
um, we should, if the technology works, be able to have a conversation for some minutes. Um, and I've jotted up here three websites which you can go to if uh, you want to know more about my work or the work of Project Zero or the work I was talking about at the very end, what is it to be a good worker, a good person, a good citizen. So thank you very much for your attention.